I'll start again. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, now we have the last three talks of the day, the three half hour talks. And um, first of the three, we have to welcome Yun Ching, a uh, fresh student for Princeton. And he'll be telling us about um, time reverse symmetry and, and gauge theory in the modern world. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. So, and today I'm going to talk about the dynamics of the symmetry in each SU2 Young Mill theory. Um, this talk is based on um, the three works uh, in collaboration with Zhe Ye from Tsinghua University, uh, Juan Wang from Harper's MSA, and Yi Zhuang from USD. Okay, so let me start with some motivations. Uh, so, in recent years, there are huge progresses on the, <coughs> from the phases of the uh, gauge series in 2001D. And uh, these developments are based on the better understandings of the ghost full structures of the global symmetries that we talk about on it, and the transcendence matter dualities. And these developments are based on and also have various applications in condensed matter physics, such as the um, half field under levels interacting in topological insulator and superconductors, and the deep confined quantum variable points, as Santa discussed. Okay, so this talk I'm going to focus on the three plus one the pair of, of the story above. And the system I'm going to talk about is the SO2 Young Mill theory. There are several reasons to consider SO2 Young Mill theory. First, it's simple because it only, it's only a condensed gauge field, there's no matter field. Second, um, this, is, this theory is still non trivial. There is a running complete constant, and if you run to the IR, there may be some interesting uh, dynamics that uh, we need to explore. Okay, so uh, here's the outline of the talk. Um, first, I'm going to discuss the symmetries and anomalies of the symmetry which SO2 Young Mill theory. And uh, later, I'm going to discuss the two type, uh, two scenarios of dynamics. First, I'm, yeah. How about SO3? Yeah, uh, you can gauge the one point symmetry to obtain SO3, but let's first understand the, okay. the theory before gauging. Okay, so uh, in the first scenario, I'm going to discuss uh, time for the uh, symmetry is spontaneously broken, so there are interesting physics on the domain wall. And the further, I'm going to discuss. Um, I'm going to assume that when the SO2 Young Mill theory flows to a U1 quantum spin liquid and discuss the phase transition between U1 quantum spin liquid and the trivial vacuum. And the transition is what we call the gauging constant bottom vertical points. Okay, so here's the, uh, here's the Lagrangian for the SO2 Young Mill theory in the 3 plus 1D. Um, notice that there is a top of the Zeta term, and it's well known that the sigma is quantized to be two part, periodically two parts. And it's well known that the theory is time versus symmetric if and only if the theta is 0 or pi mod 2 pi. So if we focus, only focus on the time versus symmetric series, we need, to, we need to couple it to the background gauge fields of the time versus symmetry. So what does that mean? We need to formulate the theory on a possibly unreachable manifold. And, and the theory also has another one um, global symmetry, which is what we call the one for global symmetry. And the one for symmetry acts on the SU2 gauge field by shifting the Z2 flag connection up to the one, uh, Z SU2 gauge field. So it's easier to understand how the uh, Z2 one global symmetry acts on the Wilson lines. So if you have a SU, Wilson line in the SU2 fundamental representation, the one for global symmetry uh, just uh, gives the Wilson line a minus sign. So it means that the Wilson line has charge one under the uh, one for global symmetry. So this is, uh, it's, it's better to compare this to, to the case where we have a familiar Z, zero form global symmetry where the charge ob object is a quantum cooperator. And uh, um, here, one form symmetry, for one form symmetry, the charge object is just a loop or a line. Okay, so now we further need to couple, this, uh, couple the system to the background field of the one form symmetry. So what does that mean? It means that when we couple it to a background field, this minor sign is no longer a constant. It depends on the um, position of the space time. And so it means that the Wilson line is no longer gauging bearing on the background gauge transformation. Therefore, in order to make a gauging bearing object containing the Wilson loop, we really need to couple the Wilson loop to a surface operator, where the combination of the Wilson loop and the surface operator is a gauging bearing object. And uh, here, B is a two-form background field for the one-form global symmetry. This is also, is, uh, is also beneficial to compare it to the zero-form symmetry, where the, uh, we have a point like operator charged on zero-form symmetry, and the coupling to the background field for the zero-form symmetry just so it means attaching the point like operator to a, to a string. Okay, so um, as I discussed before, that's the Wilson loop carries one-form symmetry quantum number and charge one. 
So one may also wonder whether the Boson loop also carries the constant numbers of a time process symmetry or more generally the Lorentz symmetry. So because the Boson line is invariant on the time process symmetry, so we may decorate the surface of the Boson line by an SPT protected by Lorentz symmetry. And uh, the most general SPT protected by Lorentz symmetry uh, contains the two terms. Here, what I wrote is K1 times W1 squared plus K2 times W2 where W1 and W2 are the mini classes of the tangent bundle of the space-time manifold. And the K1 and K2 are 0 or 1, indicating the absence or presence of these two terms. So what does these two terms mean? So first of all, let's focus on the W1 squared. W1 squared is a top order action for the 1 plus 1 d Hodan chain. So we know that Hodan chain is a SPT protected by time of symmetry. So it means that on the boundary of such a, uh, such a two-dimensional surface, so here is a, is a loop, uh, on, the boundary of the, on the boundary of the disk, uh, we have a, it, there is a Kramer's doublet. So it means that as we decorate the surface by a W1 term, the time vessel property of the Boston line is changed. It changes from a Kramer's singlet to a Kramer's doublet. So similarly, we can also discuss the W2 term, where we know that the W2 characterizes the projective representation of the two pi rotation of the space time. So it means that once we decorate the surface of the Wilson line by a W2 term, the statistics of the Wilson line is changed. It changes from boson to a fermion. Therefore, in combination, we have four choices of, uh, of four choices of how we assign the uh, Lorentz symmetry quantum number to the Wilson lines, uh, indicated by the pair of numbers k1 and k2. So we know that now we know that there are really four different assemblies of Lorentz symmetry in which SU2 Young Mill theory. So once I hand you our SU2 Young Mill theory, we really need to specify what K1 and K2s are. Okay, so now we're. Oh, so then this uh, Wilson line, Wilson loop, uh, actually depends on the choice of the surface? Yeah, uh, so what do you mean by Wilson loop? Well, so Wilson loop is just this loop, and if it de is decorated by a line, uh, decorated by a surface, then the symmetry property, symmetry quantum number, on the Wilson loop is changed. So it's just like uh, so it's just like if we um, so if we couple it to the background field of the one-point symmetry, then the Wilson loop no longer transform; it's no longer gauging band on the one-point symmetry background transformation. Okay, but well, let's say we don't want the background one form gauge field, but we just want time reversal, right? Yeah. Or maybe not even time reversal, maybe we want yeah. fermionic yeah. particles. Are you saying that to make sense of the Wilson loop, we actually have to attach a surface to it? No, it, it's a choice of whether we attach a surface to it or not. If we attach a surface, so we can consider, compare two cases where one is there's no surface, one there is a surface. These two Wilson lines are all both well defined, but their quantum numbers are different. But then in the second case, it seems like the answer you get will depend on the choice of the surface. Or so or there are of, four different choices of surfaces? No, there's choice of K1, K2, but there is also choice of how you bound Wilson line or not. Uh, yes. Oh, um, let me see. So it's a it's a SP. So it's just a, like a SPT, and uh, so we, we can feel the Wilson line loop as a one-dimensional theory, and the surface is just a, and the SPT that bounded in the one-dimensional hybrid. So it's in that sense, yes. I think it's the way to say probably it's like a, the quantum number of a Wilson line can be probed by this way. Yes, the it's theory of Wilson line has certain quantum number, quantum number, but then this is one way to probe. If the quantum number of Wilson I contain the sacramentalist doublet, then you can prove by coupled to the two surface, which has this W1 square term. You know, the SU2 theory can be defined on the lattice, so which is supposed to be fixed everything. If right. the lattice is against the other. Sure, so, so let's start from this uh, tensor product structure of uh, Hilbert space, then that's what the sample was talking about. Then you need to start from the UV where the there's only matter field, and the matter field in the deep UV can be boson or fermion, fermion single doublet. And the Wilson line will be in version of the low energy and ion. I see. So those so, are the way so, to engineer. So for the pure lattice gate theory, 
like both K1, K3 equal to zero. Right. Yes. And if you choose boson and the and, uh, signal. Then here you'll say that uh, actually you have a matter of field. Yeah, oh, you okay, okay. If you engineer deep UV matter field to be boson, chromos, doublet, and then the gauge field emergent. Yes, actually, we are, but there's a confusion because of the uh, this uh, so called fermion matter field coupled to gauge field. Mm -hmm. So the model is still bosonic, no fermion. That's right, that's yeah. right. So the total model does not depend on spin structure. Um, so maybe, maybe let me put it another way. That is, uh, whether this, uh, I'm kind of curious, whether this relate to whether this, uh, the S2 uh, double is a fermion or boson or not. Do you talk about that? Yeah. Double so, so you say S2 gate theory, there is a choice that the S2 uh, double charge can be boson or fermion. Yes. That, that allow you to choose a K2 equal to zero or one. Okay. Yes. Yes. That is, yes. Uh, that is yeah. Okay. So let me proceed. So we have discussed uh, coupling the background fields uh, to the one point symmetries and the time growth symmetry separately. But now let's couple them together. Uh, so not, now let's turn on both backgrounds together. So if we do so, we immediately encounter a problem. The problem is that once we couple the series to the Z2 one point symmetry background field B, then some of the terms in this action is not what is not Z2 value anymore. It's not a mod, mod 2 quantity anymore. So it means that those terms cannot be formulated on an orientable manifold. So if we really want to form the theory on an orientable manifold, we need to we need to lift those on not Z2 uh, not multiple value terms to a 5D integral, which turns out to be a multiple integral, which turns out to be multiple quantity in five dimensions. And uh, those uh, 5D uh, terms is what we call the anomaly polynomial. And uh, so here, uh, anomaly polynomial can be um, exactly derived, and here is the expression. The first term is the standard anomaly between time reversal and the one form global symmetry, which is also discussed in these papers. And the, the remaining two terms come from the non trivial um, contribution of the symmetry rationalization. Now, here I need to emphasize that the, only the first term is the genuine anomaly, and the second term is not. The reason is that the second term, which is determined by K2, it, when we evaluated the theory, this term on a closed 5D manifold, uh, is, uh, this term contributes trivially. So it means that uh, this term is only non vanishing when, we, when M5 is an open manifold, which is bounded by the 4D. So this is why we call it such a term, like WW like counter terms instead of the general norm. But here, I, just, I go here uh, for, for the reasons that I will become clear. Okay, so so far for anomalies and symmetries. And now we can use the anomalies to constrain dynamics. First of all, let me discuss the general SEO field dynamics. And here is the standard law which people usually give to be true, especially for large n. So I say that equals zero, it's believed that the theory flows to a trivial vacuum where both time and one point symmetries are unbroken. And I say that equals pi um, because there is an anomaly. And so the theory the cannot flow to a trivial vacuum where both symmetries are un unbroken. And, uh, and it's usually believed, it's believed, especially for large n, that the theory uh, flows to a uh, flows to a local energy theory where time flow symmetry is uh, spontaneously broken. However, the one form global symmetry is not. However, for uh, the n equals two case, SU2 EMR theory, most scenarios are okay, that people can believe to, can, that, that can be happen, that can happen. This is, uh, so for example, in particular, I'd say that was pi, and the theorem may possibly flow to deconfined uh, phases. For example, it can flow to deconfined gapless phases, uh, which is described by the U1 Maxwell theory, or deconfined gapless phases, or which can be possibly be described by the Z2 TQLT. Here, deconfinement means the spontaneous breaking of the uh, Z2 one form global symmetry. So the intuition behind why the SU2 theory may, may possibly flow to deconfined phases is just because if we compute the one loop function, uh, one loop beta function, for a generic SUN young males, then we find that it's proportional to, my, uh, to, to n. So it means that when n is large, as we go to the infrared limit, the coupling constant goes fast. So the smallest um, possible number of n is n equals 2. So it means that when n equals 2, the coupling constant, coupling constant goes, far, uh, go, uh, uh, goes the slowest as we go to the infrared. Uh, this is just a contribution from the one-loop function. 
So it's at n equals two. It's, it, it's potentially possible that uh, there may be some higher loop corrections which um, can cancel this uh, negative correction contribution to one loop data function, such that theory may flow to decompound phases. Okay, so this is uh, <clears throat> so. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to uh, ask, ask, address the following question. So we know that there are four different kinds of symmetry in which SU2 Yamil theory, and the question is how the dynamics may differ among these four different symmetry conditions. Okay, so let's focus, first I'll focus on the case when time flow is spontaneously broken. When time flow is spontaneously broken, then we have two vacuum, and uh, the time flow is all exchange a two vacuum. And now let's first discuss a case when there is a trivial symmetry fractionalization, k1, k2, or 0. And first, I'm first uh, going, to, uh, going to understand that the anomaly in the bulk uh, induces the anomaly on the domain. So how is that? So we can consider, because there are two vacuum, we can consider a special configuration where the, uh, to the left, and side, left side of the space, we have vacuum 1, and right hand side of the space, we have vacuum 2. So in between, there is a domain wall. And if we compute, uh, if we, so we know that there is a mixed anomaly between time reversal and morphon symmetry, which means that if we start with a Pachin function on, on vacuum one and do a time reversal, tran time reversal transformation, then we get a Pachin function of vacuum two, but uh, those, these two Pachin functions are not identical. They are identical only up to a phase. This phase is given by the SPT of, uh, of the one form global symmetry void. So this SPT is precise, uh, so, so we can see directly from this picture that the domain wall is a boundary between the SPT and the trivial theory. So it means that this SPT provides a anomaly in flow toward the anom of the domain wall. So in conversion, we have, we have argued that the anom anomaly in the bulk induces an anomaly on the domain wall. And uh, so the question is, uh, what theory lives on the domain wall in order to saturate such an anomaly in flow of, of the domain wall? And uh, I mean, these authors have argued that the simplest uh, theory that lives on the domain wall is called a semi on TPLT. In this TPLT, there is only one non trivial operator, which is the semi operator, which has a self statistical one quarter. Okay, so if, now let's proceed to consider the case when there is a non trivial symmetry fractionalization. So in this case, if we run the argument as before, we, as before, we can find that so the anomaly in the bulk. In uses are not normal So, so here, this uh, uh, SU two fundamental reputation will carry some kind of a framework double. Yes. So, okay. The, yeah. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so once we write down this naive expression of the uh, domain one anomaly, we immediately encounter a puzzle. The puzzle is that the first term is not a mod two quantity; it's a mod four quantity, which means that we cannot put this theory on on the manifold. However, in the second term, there is a, well, a steep, first a semi steep winning class here. So it means that we need to formulate this, this term on an algebra manifold. So it looks like there is a, uh, is a contradiction between them. So the contradiction is, comes from the fact that we have misidentified the global symmetries on the domain work correctly. So even for the case when there is a trivial symmetry fractionalization, as we discussed before, the time reversal is not a symmetry on the domain wall. In fact, on the time reversal symmetry, the semi TQLT is mapped to the anti semi TQLT. So, what's the symmetry on the domain wall? So, it's a, there is an emergent unitary symmetry, which is a combination of time reversal and the CRT, where R is the refraction on the, uh, on the direction perpendicular to the domain wall. And so, why uh, such a unitary symmetry is a symmetry on the domain wall? So, first, let's check uh, this case where K1, K2 are both zero. So in this case, because time reversal and CRT are both anti-unitary, so uh, both of them flip the spin of the semi-operator. So the combination of them, which is the unitary symmetry, the unitary operator, which <coughs> preserves the spin of the semi-operator, so it indeed maps the semi onto the semi itself. So it, indeed it's a symmetry, at least for k1, k2 equals zero. Now the question is, what's the domain wall theory that lives on the domain, or what's the domain wall theory that lives on uh, corresponding to the k1 equals 1. So if we compare the theory in the bulk, we know that um, the theory for k1 equals 1 and 0 differ by symmetry fractionalizations. So it's natural to believe that the theory on the domain wall also 
uh, deferred by uh, symmetry fractionalizations. But so what symmetry are we considering on the domain wall? So because the parent result is not a symmetry on the domain wall, but here u symmetry is. So the domain wall theory corresponds to k1 equals 1 is indeed the u symmetry in which the semi empty field T. So the next question is how the u symmetry acts on the semi -ons. So first, we have already seen that the u maps the semi to semi itself. But semion can transform projectively on the U, which means that semion can carry fractional charge on the U symmetries. Then, uh, more concretely, we can add the U twice on the semion and it gives us either plus or minus signs. So the question is how to determine whether it is a plus or minus. Um, we can argue by considering the, uh, so here I claim that the U squared acting on the semion is, in, is minus one instead of plus one. This can be argued by looking at the uh, uh, surface operator attached to the semions on the domain wall. And I'll skip the derivations for time, for the sake of time. And now we can go back, come back um, to revisit our puzzle in the beginning. Our puzzle was that, um, so our, our puzzle originates in the fact that uh, uh, we have misidentified global symmetries on the domain wall. So here, if we turn on the correct background, which here, y is the background field for the unitary symmetry in U. So if we turn on the correct background, we can indeed check that the semi particular T with projective representation U on the semi is indeed saturated such a model. Okay, so we can play a similar game for all the other symmetry in which the cases, and we can find that the, 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 all the, uh, we can work out all the details and the quantum numbers are attached of, of the semi and also the anomalies. Here is an interesting fact. The fact is that we know that, remember that in the bulk, the anomaly only depends on k1. Remember that the k2 is indeed implies that this term is indeed the counter term rather than the genuine anomaly. But here, we have found that um, the anomaly on the domain wall do depend on k2, which means that not only the anomaly on the bulk induces the anomaly on the domain wall, but also the counter terms in the bulk also induces a non-trivial anomaly on the domain wall. So this is an a, a interesting fact I want to highlight. Okay, so now let me proceed to the last uh, second scenario, where I, uh, I'm going to assume that SU2 yang mu's SC equals pi flows to a U1 point Yes? I mean, could it be that the different choices of K2, that it's like, it's not really, that it's like a phase transition on the domain wall rather than a, no, it's not a phase transition. All, all of things are gapped. No, but let's say you have two different K2s. Could yes. it be that the two uh, topological field theories that define are actually related by phase transition on the domain wall only? Uh, well, no, because uh, so for each of the case, the bulk series are all different. So. I'm not sure what you what you mean by phase transition. So you, you seem to assume that the box zero is the same, but there is a phase transition on the box. But here the story is different. The story is that we have four different box series, and they have four different domain wall series. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to assume that so the SO2 Yami also flow to a gapless series, deconfined U1 Maxwell series. So deconfined means that so the Z2 one form global symmetry is spontaneously broken. But here I'm also, I'm, I'm all, I will allow that term, but still have good symmetry of TNIR. So Sandu and his collaborators uh, found that um, the U1 Maxwell series with theta equal zero pi can describe the Lorentz physics of time flows symmetric U1 point of spin liquids. So they found that there are seven phases. Six of them are described by theta equals zero um, U1 Maxwell series, and one is described by the theta equals pi uh, U1 Maxwell series. So these seven phases are distinguished by the statistics and the time inversal properties of the dynamic line operators uh, in the U1 Maxwell series. So now the question is, we know that there are four different symmetry in which the SU2 Yang mills, and we also know that there are seven different symmetry in which the U1 Maxwell series. And if we assume that the SU2 YAMLs may fall to U1 Maxwell theory, how the symmetry enrichments match between UB and R? So this is a question I'm going to address. Okay. So to simplify our life, uh, I'm going to assume that the YAML theory is a large mass limit of the uh, SU2 QCD. Okay, 
So, um, so we know that when, so as I said to this, uh, discuss in the previous talk, that when the, uh, when the number of flippers is large enough, then, and also when the mass is zero, then the theory is believed to flow to a fixed point. Yeah. Uh, is to flow to a free, free field theory, so it's a fixed point. So it means that, so here's the phase diagram. We have a, we have a this is a mass axis, and uh, here, we, if we focus on the plane where there is a, uh, where the mass is equals zero, then all the coupling constants are flowing towards the same fixed point. And we can tune the mass to be larger and that positive. So this could give us the SU2 Young Mills with theta equals zero. And we know that, uh, so in, in, the, in, the in the discussion of dynamics, I, uh, several slides ago, uh, I've discussed that the SU2 Young Mills is usually believed to flow to a trivial, trivial theory. Now we can also deform the mass to be uh, larger and negative, which gives us the SU2 Young Mills with theta equals nf times pi. Because if we are interested in the case when theta equals pi, mod 2 pi, then we really demand that here that we, we restrict ourselves to the case where nf equals r. OK, so considering the SU2 QCD has a, another advantage. The advantage is that, if we consider, is that this gives us a potentially possible mechanism for the SU2 Young Mills uh, flow into a U1 from the spin degree. So why is that? So this is a. a this is done by considering the higher order, potentially uh, higher order terms of the uh, fermion fields. So here is the higher order terms. And uh, if we stare it long enough, we're going to find that. So, OK, so let me explain this way. So first, uh, let me, let's focus on the case. Let's focus on the plane where mass equals 0. So as I discussed, all the coupling constants are flown to the same fixed point. However, when we deform the plane away from the mass equals 0, then um, such a scenario may, may, be, may not be whole. So it's potentially possible that when, when we define the mass to be large and negative, then the coupling constant u may flow strong. And if it flows strong, it will consequently introduce, induce a SU2 tributary condensation, which will break, spontaneously break the SU2 gauge group to a U1 gauge group. OK, so now, so this gives us a potentially possible mechanism for the SU2 young males to flow to a U1 from the spin liquid. So now the question is how the symmetry nutrients, uh, how the symmetry fractionalization uh, match between the UV, uh, match between the SU2 young males and the U1 from the spin liquid. Okay, so here is the time first of assignment for the um, fundamental fermions, uh, fundamental Dirac fermions. And uh, uh, here we need to emphasize that the Poseidon is map to Poseidon data. So we need it. So now we can immediately uh, work out the symmetry nutrients of the SU2 young males. So we immediately uh, find that the K2 equals 1. This is precisely because the SU2 is coupled to the uh, fermions. So it means that we'll summarize the fermion uh, if we go to large mass limit. But now we can not read out, directly read out what K1 is, namely whether the well summarize are almost double or singly. Precisely because of here, precise map to precise dagger, so um, Kramer's degeneracy is not a, a lot different point. But we will eventually determine what K1 is using the anomaly flow. So, next, I'm going to discuss the symmetry fractionalization of symmetry enrichments of the U1 from the spin liquid. This is done by analyzing the symmetries of the U1 from the spin liquid uh, and carefully. So, the fact that uh, the, in, the important fact is that. Uh, the remaining uh, unbroken U1 gauge group acts on the uh, fermion in this way. And if we com combine this U1 and time reversal, we're going to see that they commute. So it forms, so such a U1 point spin liquid can be viewed as a gauged version of the uh, A3 fermionic topological systems. So we know that A3 SPT is classified by, uh, by this, the A times Z2. And here Z2 is independent of U1, so it's irrelevant to our discussion. And so we only focus on the Z8. The Z8 is characterized by a topological index mu, which counts the number of uh, number of fermions charged on the U1. So here, because each flavor of fermion, SU2 fundamental fermion, carries charge, uh, uh, contributes to two fermions charged on the U1. So the total topological index is two times that. So, um, so now uh, these are the symmetry aspects, and we can. Proceed to discuss uh, how the um, 
the quantum numbers of the dynamic bounds in the H3 class. So it turns out that, that um, the U1 quantum spin, spin liquid can be conveniently characterized by these symbols. So it's an EF and BT, which means that the E particle is a fermion and also time reversal odd, and the M particle is time reversal even, but it's a pretty much double. And I'm going to skip this uh, derivation. And so now we have uh, we, we have uh, found the, the symmetry instruments for the Young spin liquid. And remember that here we only determine what K2 is for the SU2 Young Mills. And so, the, so what is the K1? K1 is precisely determined by matching the anomaly between the UV and the IR. So we can work out the anomaly in the UV uh, SU2 Young Mills as we did before. And uh, we can also work out the SU2. Uh, anomaly of the U1 quantum spin liquid, which I have not shown this slide, but we can eventually do so. So we can, once we do the anomaly matching, we give us this uh, symmetry assignment. So this is a phase diagram for the SU2 QCD. And from this phase diagram, we immediately know that there, the SU2 QCD can be a direct second order phase transition between U1 from the spin liquid, uh, EF and DT, and a trivial vacuum. So uh, now we can reverse the logic and ask, whether there is a simpler phase transition between uh, uh, this EF and VT and your uh, liquid and your vacuum. So we know that this is a deconfinement to confinement transition, and usually such a confinement transition is driven by condensing some bosons. For example, if we start with EP and V, then, so both, of, both E and M are bosons, then we can either confine E, which consequently confine M, or either condense M, which consequently condense or confine E, and give us the trivial phase. But for the EF and VT, we cannot do so. It's simply because E is a fermion, so we cannot condense them. Uh, M is a fermion double, so condense M will spontaneously will break the time reversal. We can all, or we can also condense a pair of M, um, but uh, there is a remaining uh, deconfined degrees of freedom that remains in the so it means that the, trip, the simple condensation approach within the abelian theory cannot assess the direct phase transition between the, this U1 between this U1 quantum spin liquid and the trivial vacuum. But however, as we see that SU2 QCD can do the job. So we know that so we we we, can, we name the SU2 QCD as a gauge in counts the quantum particle point. So here's the summary. So first, uh, we know that there are four different kinds of symmetry in which the SU2 young mills. Second, we have discussed the domain wall theory. The domain wall is also symmetry in which, and there is an emerging miniature symmetry, and there is also an interesting relation between the anomaly in the domain wall and the anomaly in the bulk. Also, uh, we have also, if we assume that SU2 uh, young mills flows to a one quantum spin liquid, then we can find that the SU2 QCD can be a direct a second order phase transition between the EF and BT constant liquid and the trivial vacuum, which gives us uh, the, which we call it the gauging constant point. Yeah. Thank you. Um, maybe then we can start while we address any questions people might have.